So hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to another lecture on information security and more specifically, welcome to another lecture on cryptography. Our topic of today is a bit of the counterpart to last week's topic where we spoke about authentication. Today's everything about encryption, so protecting confidentiality. Um, so if we recap a bit where we currently are in our um, in our curriculum or in our timetable, uh, it looks as follows. So we first, in the first week, had an... Uh, the remote is not work. Ah, it is working now. Okay, so first week we had a little bit of an introduction, which I didn't list again here. Uh, last week, as I said, we spoke about protecting uh, integrity. In particular, we had a look at symmetric authentication schemes like hash functions and message authentication codes. Uh, today, it's time to protect another very important um, and maybe even more famous than uh, integrity, uh, such a, a security property, namely confidentiality. Uh, specifically, we're going to have a look at encryption schemes uh, with a focus on so-called authentication encryption schemes, which are a combination of protecting confidentiality and protecting integrity. Today is also uh, the first time that we have a closer look inside the primitives that we already happily loose, used last week without actually knowing that um, these building blocks or how, how these building blocks can actually be constructed. Um, this is exactly the middle of our crypto part. Uh, next week we're going to jump on to asymmetric cryptography and then further up in the stack to protocols and applications. Um, Okay, so let's have a closer look at what we did last week. Um, you have a slight echo in the stream. Um, I'm not sure where that would come from. It's the same setup as usually. Um, let's have a look. I will get that fixed. I don't know if the speakers are on or somewhere. Wait a second. We get that fixed. I didn't find any real source where the echo could come from, so um, there's also no video running in the background. Um, okay, I guess it's the other people um, who are uh, echoing themselves. Okay, um, by the way, I also just noticed that the chat isn't popping up, um, but what is popping up instead is uh, down here the questions indicator. Um, so. Um, if you have urgent questions, maybe we can just um, ask them via Mentimeter. You already saw the link in the description of YouTube. Um, and um, then we can answer them right here. Um, or I will also read them off um, the chat, which I have open here beside me. Okay, um, anyway, we were saying where we were and what we did last week. Um, so what did we do? Um, we had a look at several different types of um, schemes and the remote is also reluctant today. Tech is really not liking me today. Maybe the battery needs to be replaced or something. Uh, okay, let's grab the keyboard and switch onwards there. Okay, so um, we had a look at first um, hash functions, which are a type of authentication scheme which works without keys. Um, which means that anybody can compute the verification tag and anybody can verify. We also had a look at some schemes with a key, namely with a symmetric key, which are then called max message authentication codes, where only the owners of the key can compute and verify. What we didn't yet have a look like, because it's for uh, next week, is signatures, where, any, where only one person can compute the tag, but anyone can verify. And um, when we looked at these schemes, we noticed that they have a particular um, structure. Namely, uh, we had inside what we called the primitive. Last week we focused particularly on compression functions, 
meaning that um, we have a function whose input is larger than the output because it compresses a t-bit state and an m-bit message into another t-bit state. Okay, um, and um, then uh, we put these uh, schemes into a mode of operation. Uh, specifically, last week we had uh, well, last week we had uh, the merkle darmgard mode of co um, of operation for compression functions, which extends them into a hash function that works for inputs of arbitrary length. Okay, but to have a bit of a closer look about what we did last week, let's have a look at the recap quiz which I prepared again, where uh, you'll again get a few questions about last week's um, contents, um, and this will again work via Menti. Uh, it's a bit more questions this time than we had last week, um, since you uh, told me that you want more of that. So if you please join the uh, Quiz now. I'll wait a few seconds before we actually start the question. I see many of you have already joined. Let's wait a tiny bit longer. Um, again, um, you have, um, depending on the question, between 20 and 25 seconds of time to answer. Um, you um, will get more points if you answer sooner. Uh, and of course, you need to take into account that we again have the usual delay. And while you're joining, I'm having a look at whether YouTube is open somewhere. So there we go. And I guess most of you have joined by now. So let's start the quiz with the first question. which is, what are the two main security goals of Max? So three, two, one, and time is up. Let's have a look at what you voted. Oh, <laughs> that is a pretty torn result. So, um, here you, uh, which is something I forgot to say, I'm sorry about that. Here you, in all of the quiz questions, you can actually um, uh, vote for multiple correct questions. So what are the two main security goals? Um, in this case, the correct answers are integrity and authenticity. So let's have a look what are the wrong answers that were popular. Um, okay, many of you voted for confidentiality. So, well, unfortunately, Macs do not protect the confidentiality. They do not hide the message from the, um, not necessarily hide the message from the, um, from the adversary. They also do not themselves provide the message to the recipient. So when you use a Mac, you always send along the original message plus the authentication tag, um, meaning it does not by itself protect um, confidentiality. Okay, um, let's have a look at the next question. Um, what is a useful authentication factor? The options are something you know, something you are, something you give away, and something you have. Again, multiple um, answers may be correct. I hear that many people are reporting single choice. Um, okay, well, we'll see how that uh, shows up here. I definitely selected multiple choice. Um, Okay, so again, uh, most of you figured out that something you know and something you have are good ideas as authentication factors. Something you know being, for example, your password. Something you have could be, for example, your key in the classical sense or, for example, an authentication FIDO token or something in the computer science sense. Uh, something you are is also a correct answer, referring to biometrics, for example. Um, something you give away does not look like a good idea to me, since if you give it away, you don't have it anymore, usually, and somebody else has it, so I don't think that's a good idea for authentication. 
Okay, let's have a look at the third question. For which of these do you need the secret key to verify authenticity? Max, signatures, hash functions and or password hashing. Time's almost up. Let's have a look. So, um, oh, this time the correct answer didn't even win. Um, first, maybe one more comment on uh, some uh, what people have written in the chat about the previous question. If you remember, the previous question was about authentication factors. And somebody th said that giving away public keys, keys um, can be useful for authentication. It's true that public keys can be a building block for um, certain senses of authentication. However, first with public keys, we usually mean signatures and these are usually not for message authentication or are often in practice and protocols um, used for entity authentication, even though they actually protect the message. Uh, the other thing is that the public key that you give away is not your actual authentication factor, but your authentication factor would be the corresponding private key since this is what you identify by. So identification factor does not just mean anything that is involved in the authentication process, but it means the one thing that defines who you are, who is the legit user. Um, and possession of the secret key or private key in a public key scheme would be this, um, this factor. Anyway, back to this question. Uh, since we're talking about secret keys, where do you need the secret key to verify? So the correct answer here is message authentication codes where both the person who computes the tag and the person who verifies it need the secret key. Whereas uh, for signature schemes, you only need it to sign but not to verify. In hash functions, nobody has a key at all. And in password hashing schemes, um, you uh, do not need the secret key. Oh, you actually do need the secret key to uh, verify but uh, not in the sense of recomputing a tag. So this was, uh, could also be counted as a correct answer here, since the uh, password hashing scheme is simply handing over your key. So you would need the secret key in order to verify it. So this is also correct, actually. Um, okay, uh, next question, there we come. Which of these inputs or outputs does a message authentication code have? Again, several of these can be correct. So there we go. This time, finally, the uh, good answers or the correct answers did a pretty good job. So one of the correct answers, since we discussed it already, is the secret key, which you need um, on both ends, which you plug into the message. Uh, the message itself uh, is also another input to the MAC scheme, whereas the tag is the output. Um, no public keys are involved in case of a MAC. Okay. Um, we're only in the middle of the quiz, so we do have a few more uh, questions, three more to go. And the next one is, which of these are security properties of a hash function? Where the options are unforgeability, um, collision resistance, second premature resistance and key recovery resistance. Time's almost up. And uh, collision resistance is the most popular answer. It's also one of the two correct answers, the other being second pre-image resistance. So collision, pre-image and second pre-image resistance are the three classical properties of a hash function. Uh, we also did mention unforgeability last week, which probably explains why it got some points. This is because unforgeability is the main property of MEX. 
And key recovery resistance is also something provided by MEX. Question number six. Your major software distribution uh, companies distributing automated software updates. How do you authenticate your updates? Do you use signatures? Do you encrypt the updates? Do you hash the updates? Or don't you need any crypto to achieve this? So most people chose the correct answer. So signature are um, the most widely used way to achieve this. Um, those people who selected hash functions um, are uh, a bit right in the sense that yes, hash functions are actually usually part of signature schemes. So you first hash the data and then you sign it. However, hash functions alone are not enough to, um, to protect um, your software updates in case of automated updates. Uh, because in automated updates, you usually have only one communication channel where you would need to send both the message and the hash of the message, which is new every time. And uh, anyone who can modify the um, message um, can also modify the hashtag, which is why it's important to also sign the hash value. So half right, totally right, because this alone is not sufficient. Okay, let's head on to the final question. How do you protect your user's passwords? Which scheme do you use? MD5, AES, CBC, SHA3 or PBKDF2. Okay, um, by a far margin, one of the rather wrong answers, um, but understandable answers, uh, made the race here. So the correct answer is PBKDF2, which we only briefly mentioned um, last week. This uh, is short for password based key derivation function. And it's a hash function that is specially designed for passwords, uh, meaning it's not only um, it don't, not only provides the security properties, but it's also relatively slow, and it supports things like inputting a salt, um, adapting the how slow it is so that it can also still be used in five years or ten years by just um, pushing up the parameters. Hash function uh, SHA three is also um, a bit okay in the sense that yes, it is a hash function, which is um, a useful ingredient for uh, password hashing. However, um, SHA-3 is not intended for password hashing. In particular, it's very, very fast. So SHA-3 is a good choice if you want to compute your um, hash, uh, for example, in the context of TLS or um, as part of the signature scheme to sign your code. However, it's not well suited as a password hashing scheme because it just doesn't fulfill the additional requirements. But it is a very secure function that is good to use, just not for passwords. And these two unfortunately got uh, not too many votes. So MD5 is unfortunately often still accidentally used for um, password hashing. It is a hash function, but it has been insecure or known to be insecure for 15 years or so um, and was never well suited for passwords to begin with. And AES CBC is an encryption scheme which we encounter today. Okay, let's have a look at the leaderboard. Um, if you had some of these half right answers and not completely right answers and uh, didn't get points for it, don't be disappointed. Um, but know that uh, you did understand uh, the stuff. Um, it was just not the completely right answer. So um, our high score uh, tells us that uh, Thomas is the uh, winner today. So congratulations. And everybody else, of course, also thanks for um, contributing and joining. Um, I saw that in the meantime, also several questions popped up. So let's have a look at those right now. Ah, this was just a comment on the 
um, echo, so this is fixed by now. Okay, um, let's head back to the um, to the um, slides. Imagine choosing MD5 in 2020. Well, unfortunately, it happens. So uh, let's head back to the slides and continue with today's contents. Slides are still not working. Uh, it looks like I nearly, really need to replace the battery. Okay, you figured out that the hearts and the question marks are actually working this time. Congratulations. Um, let's, uh, let's see if the mouse works for forwarding the slides. No, it does not. So I really need to go forward to the keyboard every time. So what's the outline for today? Um, <laughs> if you do misuse those too much, I might have to turn them off, off, off at some point. So if you actually plan to use them in a constructive way, please um, restrain yourselves right now. Um, so what's the outline for today? First, I want to introduce the security property that we talk about today, which is um, confidentiality. And I want to first explain what are the goals of this and where is it applied? Then we want to talk about um, the building blocks that we already happily used last week, namely symmetric primitives. Uh, and in particular, we're, particular, we're going to look at block ciphers, since those are the typical building blocks for um, encryption schemes. And we're going to look at a specific block cipher, which you might already have heard about, namely the AES, which many of you already mentioned in the first lecture. Okay, um, encryption schemes. Um, we are going to define what do we need in an encryption scheme. We will see what's different from a straightforward block cipher, and we will have a look at two constructions for encryption schemes. Then we will head over to authenticated encryption, which is the combination of encryption with Max, and again are going to have a look at what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to look like, and how you can construct it. Okay, um, so let's start with our first topic, namely confidentiality. So what is confidentiality of data? Um, the definition is that it's supposed to prevent unauthorized entities from learning information, such as the message content, um, that the authorized parties are communicating or processing. So that's quite a mouthful, but in the end, the idea is you have data, you don't want unauthorized parties to read the data, period, that's it. Um, there are some notions that are somewhat related, but are slightly different. And uh, two of those are anonymity and privacy. So what's the difference here? Anonymity um, is about not the content of data, but about the person. And in particular, it usually means that the person who did something should not be identifiable. For example, they should only be known to belong to some set, but it shouldn't be possible to tell who it is. Um, Privacy is also related. Privacy is about data, namely data about the user. And it's about the user's right to selectively publish information about themselves. So to be able to control what other people learn about you and what they don't learn. Um, but it's not strictly um, speaking just um, data confidentiality. So the thing, uh, the scheme that solves this problem is encryption schemes. Uh, what do encryption schemes do? They take a message of arbitrary length and translate it into a ciphertext of approximately the same length. And to do this translation process, they use a key of fixed length. Um, they may also additionally um, take some other inputs or produce an authentication tag, both of which we will see examples of later. Um, so we are going to again discuss um, three schemes for this, um, two of them today and one of them next week. The first one for today is plain encryption schemes, uh, which we denote with this calligraphic E and a key in the subscript, a key between Alice and Bob, a symmetric key. Um, so encryption schemes only protect confidentiality and not authenticity. It allows only the owners of the secret key to encrypt and to decrypt. Then we have authenticated encryption schemes, which are also symmetric key schemes, but they also protect the authenticity in addition to the confidentiality. 
Um, again, only the owners of the secret key can decrypt and verify. And uh, finally, we have um, key encapsulation schemes, um, which um, use asymmetric keys, which means that anyone can encrypt the message, but only the owner of the secret key can decrypt it. So what are some examples where you actually find such schemes? Uh, the first such example is um, whenever you use a secure authentic uh, communication protocol such as HTTPS. So for example, if you navigate anywhere on your browser and you have a look at their certificate, then you will see in the certificate string um, some of these um, names here. So in the present example, what you see is AES 128 GCM, which is the name of an authenticated encryption scheme, and it also tells you the key size and so on. So uh, there you always find specified a particular encryption scheme. Um, another other example where you encounter these um, schemes is when you do disk encryption. So in the present example, this is when you use disk encryption with looks on Linux. And um, what you see here is that you first see a cipher um, on top in the red box that is for encrypting data segments. In this case, the scheme is AES XTS Plane 64. Um, you'll see that these names are always a compound of several building blocks. And both of the cases we heard so far, the first building block was AES, which denotes the primitive, and the stuff that comes after tells you the mode of operation. So how to build the encryption scheme from the primitive. And on the bottom, you also see some more information um, about where the key comes from. In this example, it comes um, from a user input and is uh, processed with a key derivation function to get the key. Okay, um, so this brings us back to something we already hinted at last week, namely that uh, whenever you look at an application with um, some encryption, you have these layers inside. The top layer is the protocol, like in the first example, TLS, or in the second example, um, the general layout of the disk encryption scheme, um, which describes how the keys are managed, which messages are sent, how all the stuff is stored on the disk, or similar. Inside of this, you have um, encryption schemes, or rather schemes, which means cryptographic building block that serve a particular purpose. So for example, ASGCM is an encryption scheme, or SHA-256 is a hash function. So these are cryptographic building blocks, simple algorithms that you can call, um, which serve a particular purpose and which are used to achieve the overarching goal of the protocol. And inside the schemes, you have primitives such as the AES, which are used to, for example, uh, process data block by block or accumulate information block by block. And these primitives are what we want to look at first today. So first primitives and then encryption schemes on top of them. And um, so these uh, symmetric primitives are the secure building blocks of everything we do. Um, and they are the most atomic building blocks that we can talk about when we talk about um, security levels. So primitives are the smallest thing that still has um, a label with a security level attached to it. So you can say, for example, this primitive is 128 bit secure. Um, everything below that, which we are going to look at in a moment, um, by itself does not have a, um, a uh, cryptographic security level. So um, since we already talked a bit about uh, primitives last week, I want to do um, another piece of uh, recap at this point. Uh, this time it's without you actually getting points. Uh, I'm just having I think two questions or so uh, to remind you about what we already saw on this. So the first question which I have is which primitives do you remember or do you already know? So this is a freestyle uh, input question. If you ca can remember any primitives from last week, either the name for certain types of primitives or the name of specific um, examples of these primitives, uh, give it a go right now. So <laughs> those are good starting points um, since we already had uh, block ciphers and AS in the rest of the recapitulation. 
Um, compression functions are also a good point. So both compression functions and permutations are excellent building blocks for, um, for hash functions. Um, there are some smaller things here which I can't all read. So SHA2, as mentioned here, um, the SHA2 compression function is a good example. RSA is a, um, a, an asymmetric building block. Um, so people who are mentioning MD5 and SHA2, uh, this name refers to both the scheme and the compression function inside. So the compression function is the building block, the primitive, and the hash function is the uh, scheme around it. Um, I have some other mentions here. So somebody mentions hash function. Um, while some people do call hash functions primitives, I personally do not, or many people in the symmetric research community do not, because um, they are not primitives in the sense of the smalling building blocks, because they do have a smaller building block inside, namely a compression function or a permutation. Um, some people can't remember, I can understand that. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much the suggestions we, um, we will get today. Um, let's have one more question with pictures, namely, which of these pictures actually shows a compression function as an example of a primitive? We already have conflicting opinions on this. But yes, the uh, correct answer is winning at this point. So um, indeed, this thing here where you see a larger input on top and a smaller input on the bottom um, is uh, denoting a compression function. Um, these pictures here both refer to two types of block ciphers, which also do have more inputs than outputs, but uh, the building block inside is a bijective function, which is different from a compression function. And here uh, on this side, you see another building block that is also used for building the same thing as permutations. However, uh, as compression functions, however, it's a permutation and not a compression function. Okay, so thanks for your inputs and let's now have a look, uh, a closer look at, um, at the one building block that we're going to need to build encryption, which is um, the block cipher. So um, what does a block cipher look like again? Um, we always denote it with this uh, box here, and you will notice that it has a small angle at the side here. So um, this is because we have two inputs to a block cipher, which we need to differentiate. The first one is the message block we want to translate, which is n bits long and translates to an n bit output. And the key, which may have a different size k, configures how this mapping looks like. And we usually annotate the key input to the box with this little triangle here and the unmarked um, input is the data block. You will see that I have two pictures here. This is because any block cipher um, must also be invertible, meaning you cannot only compute from the message to the ciphertext, but also backwards from the ciphertext to the message. And we usually denote the forward function with an E for encryption and the inverse with a D for decryption. Um, so these are inverses to each other in a mathematical sense. The one undoes the operation of the other. Um, so what can we say about uh, these sizes that are involved here? Um, so a block cipher can also be called a family of permutations, where permutation here means a bijective function a function where you can compute the inverse function. And the block cipher denotes this family in the sense that each key selects a family member and the family member is a permutation. So a function that you can compute forward and backward. And each of these permutations, each of, each of these family members has um, a total number of two to the n possible inputs because the size of the input is n. And there are two to the k possible family members in the family, where each possible key of the k-bit keys selects a family member, um, a function or a mapping. So this is what a block cipher um, looks like. Uh, what should it achieve in order to be called secure? So there are actually two main properties involved here. 
The first one is what I called here pseudo-randomness, although, although if you are a cryptographer, this is a bit of a vague description. So uh, what does uh, pseudo-randomness mean here? It means that if an attacker knows the block cipher but doesn't know the key inside, then if they are given the cipher text, they shouldn't be able to say anything about the plain text and actually also vice versa. So if they are told a plain text, they're not supposed to be able to predict anything about the cipher text that corresponds um, to this message. And the only exception to this rule is if the attacker has previ previously already learned that this particular plain text belongs to this particular cipher text, then this knowledge remains valid because block ciphers are a deterministic algorithm. The same input always gives the same output. So except for using this property, the attacker should not be able to learn anything. The other property refers to um, the additional input, namely the key. Uh, and this property is called key recovery security, which we already saw in the quiz earlier. So what it says is that an attacker um, must be unable to learn the key or information about the key, even if they can obtain ciphertexts for any message of their choice. So, um, for example, if they're able to choose plain text in a chosen plain text attack and then get from an oracle the corresponding outputs, even if this is possible for many, many plain texts and even if they can do the reverse as well, so they have an oracle that tells them, given a ciphertext, the input, they're still not supposed to learn anything about the key from this information. So you notice that um, the assumption here is a bit contradictory with this, uh, but this is what we usually have. Um, so this is typical for security properties. We say that if you are given this and that, you're not supposed to learn some other stuff. Um, and the implication is always that you may well be able to learn, for example, combinations of plain text um, and key at some point, um, because you observe. Um, you do not learn this by using a weakness in the algorithm, which would be the above case. But if you do learn by some outer circumstances, you should still not be able to extend it to learn anything that would be useful beyond this. For example, the key, because the key would allow you to read anything in the future. This shouldn't be possible. So let's have a look at how to build such a block cipher, or more specifically at the anatomy of a block cipher. Um, and it turns out that um, while there are many, many different constructions of a block cipher, they usually have some things in common. So what we're interested in here is if we have the message as an input and the key to control this operation, how can we instantiate this algorithm in the middle here? And there are two fundamental ideas that um, will um, later be used um, or that are very often used to um, to build block ciphers. The first idea is to not have one big monolithic thing inside the block cipher, like a huge lookup table that says for any plain text which is the corresponding cipher text. What you want instead is some simpler operations, uh, which is not complex enough to be a secure block cipher, but which you can iterate to make it secure. Um, this is maybe the most fundamental idea of block ciphers. So the idea is to have a simple function, which is called the round function. And then you simply repeat this round function many times. And each of the individual calls to the round function is controlled by the key. And this happens in the shape of a so-called key schedule, which means that the original input key is expanded to give you many so-called round keys. And the first round key controls the first round, the second round key controls the second round, and so on and so on. Okay, so this is the first idea. And the purpose of this is to not have one unmanageably complex circuit, but just smaller manageable circuits to replace the huge lookup table for the entire thing by something you can compute. And how this round function looks like internally, that differs a lot between ciphers. The second idea is to make the round circuit not key dependent. So to have an unkeyed um, function here, that is exactly the same in every round. And the way you introduce the round key is by XORing it before you start the round. And this is um, what is called, like written in the title, the key alternating construction. 
because you alternate between having a round, adding the key, having a round, adding the key, and so on. And what this picture doesn't show is that usually the first key is added before the first round and the last key is added after the last round. So that every call to the round function is masked by a key. So there is no round function call where you know the input or output. And um, one of the purposes of this key alternating construction is to avoid having key dependent circuitry. So to have operations which depend on the key. A few ciphers do use this. So for example, having key dependent lookup tables or so, but it's very usual, unusual and very often goes wrong. So it's often not secure. And uh, this is also linked a bit to Kerkhoff's principle, because if the key would be too tightly involved with the operation, then you would have to say this is essentially an unknown operation. And it contradicts a bit with, the, with Kerkhoff's principle, which said that the algorithm should be public and only the key, which is easily replaceable, should be secret. Okay, so this is the general layout. Now the question is, of course, what can a round function look like? So um, there are again several construction mechanisms here, and I'm just picking out the most widely used one, which is, which is the so-called SPN construction, which is short for Substitution Permutation Network. And um, the name are what the thing does. So what you see here is a picture of one round function with the input to the round function here. In the first round, this is simply the message and the output of the round here. In the last round, this output is the final ciphertext. And what you also see here is that the round starts by adding the key. So here we have the round function and the key XOR pictured with these uh, plus inside an, uh, a circle, I always mean an XOR. And the actual round function is marked here. It consists of two parts. First, the so-called substitution layer or S-box layer, which is a set of small lookup tables. So you, ta you uh, split the input that you have in the round into chunks. So for example, if it was originally, say, 128 bits, you, for example, chunk, uh, chop it down into bytes and put each of these bytes into the same lookup table. So you simply have a table that translates every possible input to every possible output of this size here. And it's one of the many possible mappings, but it's a fixed mapping, it doesn't change. The same thing is done to every block. And these um, little boxes here are called S boxes, which is short for substitution boxes. And in order to make sure that the effect of each of these boxes is diffused over the entire state, you follow this with the so-called permutation layer or P layer, which in the original sense simply means that um, you take the bits of each S box and distribute them in the state so that in the next round they will end up in other S box positions. In more modern functions or in less lightweight functions, um, you usually have a more complicated layer here, which is just, just some linear function. Linear meaning that it consists of copying things and XORing things. So for example, you could imagine taking the state, um, shifting it by a few positions or rotating it, XORing it on top and rotating it once more and again XORing it on top. That would be an example of one linear layer, what a linear layer could look like. And um, What's of course important uh, to keep in mind is that we're trying to build a block cipher here, which means we're not just supposed to be able to compute forward, but we also need to be able to compute backward. So when we design such a thing, we, we always have to think about how can we go back from the output to the input, always assuming that we know the key. And how does this work here? Well, um, I for computing the inverse, I have to go through the operations in inverse order and invert each and every one of them. So for the linear layer, what I need is the inverse linear function. Um, if you think back to linear algebra, um, you can describe every linear layer with a matrix multiplication. And in that case, the inverse can be written as the multiplication with the inverse matrix. If the step here is just uh, distributing bits, then the inverse is pretty obvious. You distribute them back in the uh, 
Same way, but in the inverse order. For the S boxes, what you need to invert them is the inverse lookup table. So instead of mapping from input to output, you need another table that maps from the output to the input. But this is easy to construct. And finally, we need to uh, invert this key addition here. But the nice thing about XORing is, if you X or A to B and then X or B again, you get A back. So XORing something twice gives you back the original thing. So in this case, the inverse of this key addition layer is exactly the same key addition layer again. Because XORing the key again removes it effectively. Okay, so these are, uh, this is one of the main um, construction mechanisms for block ciphers. And we're going to now have a look at one um, cipher that is actually constructed this way. Uh, before we do that, I have a quick look at the chat because as you already noticed, I don't have it in the picture here, so I need to go over here. So there were, uh, was mainly a question about the uh, tutorials today. Um, and I think there is a question hour and the link for it will be sent out later. Then there was a question of how secure are block ciphers? Well, as secure as it gets, the block cipher we'll come to in a moment um, achieves um, in the smallest version 128 bit security. And um, since it has already been around for a long time, as we will see in a moment, uh, many, many cryptographers have already tried to break it. And as a community, we are pretty confident um, that this is a very secure block cipher. So um, this is usually the thing you can really rely on in, in uh, protocols. Uh, of course, people do from time to time publish uh, block ciphers that are not secure. Or what also sometimes happens is that very old block ciphers get um, insecure after 20 years or so due to um, ever increasing uh, cryptanalytic knowledge of people. Um, this is usually well um, observable. So in the sense of if you read the literature, then you get a pretty good picture about how secure a block cipher is. And if a cipher has been along for a very long time, and there are many papers trying to break it and discussing why this doesn't work, then you can gain confidence in the block cipher. So um, in this sense, the block ciphers that are widely used are extremely secure. They reach, um, according to our current knowledge, the advertised security level, such as 128-bit security, meaning an attacker would need an astronomic 2 to the 128 operations to break it. Um, what other questions do we have? Um, so my key generates generates a bunch of keys which are applied to M. Um, yes, your key generates a bunch of keys. Um, this generation can be often very easy. So often the round keys are just, um, for example, rotated versions of the original key or the individual bits are reordered or something similar to the round function is also applied to the key after each round. So the key schedules can often be very simple. Um, so they essentially just um, generate slightly modified copies of the key. And we usually add also a constant at this point so that every round gets a different key. Um, and these are these bunch of round keys are then first XOR to the message, then an operation is applied, then the next key is XOR, then an operation is applied and so on. And the operation um, has the purpose of mixing the round keys in a strong and very diffuse way with the state, with the intermediate states. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, so S and P dependent, so are S and P dependent on the key? Um, no, S and P are not dependent on the key. These are static functions which are not key dependent. Um, their point is to mix the keys that are added here with, um, in a strong way with each other. Um, and the point of them is that if you just XOR the key and then you look at the next ciphertext block because you will have to apply the block cipher many times if your message is longer and you just XOR the same key again, then the properties of the message um, are not really mixed with each other. So for example, if you flip just a bit at the input message and you do the same block cipher and you just leave out this stuff here, then in the output also just one bit will be flipped, which means as soon as you have understood how one block cipher uh, block is translated or one message block, then you know how all the others are translated. And the purpose of these operations here 
is to hide this relationship. So to make sure that small changes in the message, um, for example, lead to very large and complex changes in the output message. Uh, so they are absolutely essential and if you leave them out, you don't get a secure block cipher. Um, so this SPN round thingy is special circuit or is it usually implemented in software? Uh, well, both of this is true. You can implement this thing here in software or you can implement it in hardware, depending on what your target platform is. You will see an example in a moment where you will better understand, I think, how you implement these things. Um, so in your um, computer, uh, you could manually implement this code and apply it happily, which is done for most ciphers. Um, however, for some ciphers, which are used excessively often, the circuit has already been included in your CPU. So for example, in a moment, we're going to look at the block cipher AES. And because AES is so excessively used everywhere, Intel simply decided to add instructions for the round function of AES in their CPUs, in their um, higher end CPUs. So there um, you simply have a CPU instruction that you call, which implements in hardware the circuit here. But you could also just implement it in software, then it would be a bit slower, but it also works. Um, and what these functions exactly look like, that's different between different block ciphers, because there are different design methodologies about how to do this, which also have slightly different aims. So since I've talked about it so much already, let's have a look at the AES. Uh, so this cipher is actually the output of a competition, the so-called AES competition, which ran around the turn of the millennium. So uh, it ended in 2000. And AES is short for Advanced Encryption Standard. The goal of this competition was to get a block cipher which replaces the previous encryption standard, which was called DES for Data Encryption Standard. And this competition was organized by uh, a US institution, namely the so-called Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST for short. Uh, this is um, uh, a government body that is um, in charge of setting all kinds of standards. So everything that is widely used in industry, um, like for example, they have standardized different uh, units of measuring stuff and different technology for specific purposes and so on. So they're um, a very big, um, a very big institution um, with one of their main places in Gethersburg in the US. And um, in particular, their um, standards in crypto have uh, an extremely high impact worldwide. So if they standardize something, it is likely going to be very widely used, as is the case with the AES. So how did this competition work? In 1997, uh, NIST said, we want a new block cipher. We are no longer happy with the DES because there have been attacks on it and we are looking for a replacement. And so internationally, all sorts of um, cryptography research teams um, teamed up and designed new block ciphers, which are a lot stronger than the original DES. Uh, stronger meaning both that they supported larger keys and larger message blocks, but also that um, they used the knowledge that has been gained since the de DES was designed, which was in the early 70s. Uh, so of course, a lot has happened between the 70s and 1997, a lot of learning in uh, cryptanalytic knowledge. So all of this was um, poured into the new designs, ending up in a total of 15 cipher designs from 50 cryptographers around the world. And in several rounds, these were then narrowed down to the most promising candidates. So every year or so they would kick out some of the ciphers because they thought they were not promising, either because they did have some security problems or um, the design was not clearly explained and trustful, so uh, they weren't sure if there was anything um, accidentally or intentionally, uh, intentionally hidden in there, or um, it didn't perform as well. So when you implement it in software or hardware, it wasn't that efficient and so on, so many reasons. Um, in the end, there were several finalists, all of which looked pretty promising, um, but the design that was chosen in the end is a um, cipher that was called Rheindahl, after its designers, Johan Dahmen and Vincent Reimann, uh, who are um, a team of Belgian cryptographers. 
Um, and uh, after this competition, the cipher Rheindahl was renamed to AES. And this is, with a very large margin, the most widely used block cipher. It's simply used everywhere for several reasons. First and foremost, because people trust it, because it has been standardized in a very lengthy procedure after receiving lots of analysis, and this analysis is still going on. Um, so people always try to find whether new techniques can be used in some way to weaken the properties, but so far they haven't succeeded. Um, the other reason is that it's, it was already originally pretty efficient both in hardware and in software, but since we now have the specialized um, instructions for AES in the CPUs, they've become even more um, efficient to use. Um, okay, so this is the genesis process of the cipher. Let's have a look at what, uh, how it implements this SPN strategy, because AES is an example of such an, um, such an SPN cipher. So um, the state size and key size are as follows. The cipher processes blocks of 128 bits. So N is 128. And the key, there are actually several to choose from. So the sort of default key size is 128 bits. The resulting cipher is then called AES128. There are also two versions with larger keys namely AES192 and AES256. Now, for most purposes, people use this one here because they already trust it. Um, these um, provide a slightly higher security level. Um, however, they are also a bit more costly because they do more rounds. Um, and people are also not convinced that they really need this additional um, complexity. Uh, and the um, state of, um, of AES, so first the input message, the 128-bit input message, and then later the intermediate results between the rounds, they're represented in a very special way, namely as a matrix. So what you see here is the 128-bit block, that is the input message, written as a 4x4 four four matrix, where each entry of the matrix is one byte. So this is um, an array of 16 bytes in total, which are indexed by their row number and, and column number. And the key is represented in a similar way. So if it's the 128-bit key, it looks exactly the same. For the higher keys, you have more columns, so either six columns or eight columns for the larger two sizes. And all the operations inside AES operate on this state and use this matrix view. And um, since it's organized in bytes, you can already imagine approximately that the operations are also going to be byte-based, which makes them um, well-suited for software. So what do the individual run operations look like? Um, the first step is the so-called sub-bytes step, and it's an implementation or an instantiation of this S-box step that we saw before. So what this does is the following. It takes the original state, and then applies the same S-box to each of these 16 bytes. Meaning it takes the value, looks it up in the um, lookup table, which does not depend on the key, and writes the result of the lookup table um, into the output state. So in these pictures, I always stay, show the input state here, then something happens, and then I write here the output state. So I've illustrated it only for one uh, byte here, but it happens to every byte. Um, this is also sometimes, so all of these operations have a long name, like sub bytes here, sub meaning substitute, um, and a short form, which in this case is SB. The second operation is called shift rows, and it does exactly that. It shifts the rows of the matrix, so Zeilen is the, the German term for it. Um, and shifting means the following, so for the first line, nothing happens. For the second line, the line is taken and shifted by one position or rotated by one position to the um, left. So uh, the thing that was the second entry uh, becomes the first entry after the output and so on. The third row is um, rotated by two positions and the, th the last row is uh, rotated by three positions. So in the end, um, the, the bytes themselves are not changed. Their position is simply moved around. 
And this already shows you that it's part of the linear layer or permutation layer. However, the linear layer doesn't end here because we still need some mixing between these bytes. So to make sure that a change in one of the cells also influences the other cells. And the operation that does that is called mix columns. Um, and it does exactly uh, what it advertises, namely it mixes the columns. So for each of the four columns, it takes the column, applies a linear function, which is written as a matrix. So written as a four by four matrix and it's multiplied to the column. Uh, if you multiply matrix to a column vector, you get another column vector, and this is the output of the function. Um, so this uh, step is actually a bit more um, complicated um, than it sounds here, because these multiplications of multiplying the bytes with the bytes here um, does not actually happen in the way you expect it. So this multiplication is not an integer multiplication, but it's in a so-called finite field. So finite field is a special mathematical structure, which is particularly useful because there is only um, a, a finite, so endlich, a finite number of possible values. In this case, it's the finite field with two to the power of eight elements, since one byte has two to the eight possible values. And in these finite fields, um, you can do the multiplications um, in a slightly different way than you would with integers, but it's not really complicated. Um, so if you imagine it, multiplying by one doesn't do anything. Multiplication by two actually shifts the number and potentially x or something. And multiplication by three is the result of multiplying by one, so not doing anything, and multiplying by two, so shifting the thing, and then XORing these two things together, and potentially some constant value. Um, so it's not really complicated, but if you would have to implement it, you would ha first have to read up a little on how this works. Otherwise, the matrix multiplication is like a usual mu matrix multiplication. So uh, the first thing here is multiplied with the first thing here, blah, 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 blah. These are summed up and so on. So like you like the matrix multiplications, you know. But this happens on each column separately. And you can already see now that um, this column mixing step when you do multiple rounds, it will interact a little with the uh, previous step that we saw, namely the shift rows. So if you mix the columns in one step, then in the next uh, round call, um, the outputs are shifted to different columns and then they are mixed again within the columns. So after two rounds or so, you achieve a good mixing. Okay, there is one final step still uh, missing. Um, namely the step we already know from key alternating schemes in general, which is called add round key, AK or ARK for short in AS. So what it does is it takes the current state, XORs the current round key, and that's the result, period. Very simple. Where the, the way the current round keys are computed um, reuses some of the operations we saw before. So I'm not going into details here because there are the different cases depending on the key size and so on, but it's not rocket science. So it's, it contains similar operations as you already saw, updating the key from one round to the next, plus adding a constant. Um, if you aren't sure whether you really got what was going on here, I added a link. Uh, by the way, in the handout version of the slides, you find quite a bit of description here below the pictures, which tell you approximately what I told you now. Uh, but you also find this uh, link up there in the handout version, um, which is a link to an Excel table implementation of the AES, where you can play around with it, like um, you change one of the cells and then you look which other parts changes. Maybe it helps you a bit in visualizing what's going on inside the cipher. Okay, um, that actually sums up the part about, um, about primitives. So what did we hear so far? We heard that primitives are the foundation of security in symmetric cryptography, but also in asymmetric crypto. And the important thing to keep in mind is that their security cannot be proven, but only analyzed. So the idea is a bit like with the hard problems in complexity theory. Over many years, many clever people try to find a way to solve it faster, so to attack the thing. But if after 20 years, nobody has figured out how to do it, or 
um, if they only figured out how to do it for way fewer rounds than the cipher has. Something I forgot to say is that the AES has 10 rounds in the simplest case, so in the 128-bit case, or slightly more rounds for the larger keys. Um, so if attacks only can attack something like up to five or six or seven rounds of the cipher, then we say that the cipher has a security margin of three rounds or 30%. And this security margin helps us in evaluating how trustworthy a cipher is. Um, if we look at protocols, at modern protocols like TLS version 1.3, you will find that it actually doesn't support too many different block ciphers anymore. The older TLS versions have a huge pile of different block ciphers because um, the AS is a bit of an American standard. It's used internationally, but some countries prefer having their own standards. So there is a Chinese standard and Japanese standard and a Korean standard and a Russian standard and so on. And in the old version, many of these national standards, as well as uh, some ciphers which ended up there, I don't know how. So there, there was quite a selection. In the newer versions of TLS, you only find AES for encryption purposes with these two key sizes. You find a so-called stream cipher, which is called ChaCha20, which has some different operations instead. So it, it's more focused on using existing operations on the CPU, making it a bit less well suited for hardware implementations. Um, so these are the two choices that you have for encryption. Both of them are fine, but the AES is a lot better analyzed. So people have a lot more trust in this cipher. Um, and then we have compression functions, which are used inside the hash functions. So in this case, the, um, the primitive or the scheme that is supported in TLS is are two different um, compression functions which are on 256 or 512 bit inputs and inside they have some similarities with this cha cha cipher so they also use existing cpu instructions in particular um, xors um, rotations um, modular addition meaning integer addition where anything that's over 32 bits long is just cut off um, and uh, bitwise um, multiplication, so AND operations. These are essentially the things used inside SHA-2, um, which makes it well suited for software if you don't have the dedicated instructions. So it's relatively easy to implement this year on a 32-bit CPU and this year on a 64-bit CPU. Uh, but if you try to do it in hardware, it becomes a bit more painful. And also if you try to protect it against things like side channel attacks or so, these two are quite a bit more or are, are a bit painful, let's say. Now, all of these um, are expected to provide security for quite a long time. So SHA-2 has a pretty large security margin. Um, and um, ChaCha hasn't received that much analysis, but it also looks pretty good so far. And AES has been trusted for a very long time. Okay, so that's the summary of the primitives part. Um, I would suggest that we now have a um, 10 minute break. Um, and before we go into the break, I also quickly have a look at the questions that have, um, uh, have popped up by now. So what do we have here? Uh, we have that, are all of these functions applied at the same time or can they be exchanged at will or is there a special recipe to use? Um, I'm not sure which functions this was referring to. So if it was referring to the round operations of AES, then there is a strict recipe, namely execute them in given order. So first sub bytes, then shift rows, then mix columns, then add round key, and do this 10 times, period. That's it, you can't choose. Uh, if this is about the operations in TLS on the previous slide, um, then um, you usually choose in the beginning when you set up a TLS connection, you choose which one of them you use. So you will have to choose one encryption scheme, which will use one of these two primitives, and you will use a hash function, which can be one of these here. And you set that in the beginning and then you use it through, throughout the entire um, operation. The good thing is that um, if you have two block ciphers with the same sort of interface, so same key and block sizes, then you can plug them into the same sort of 
recipes or mode of operations, but this is something we will discuss after the break. So they are in a sense modular, so in particular the block cipher is modular in the sense that you can, um, when you have a recipe how to use it, you can also plug another block cipher in its stead. Um, but in TLS you cannot change this during the, the runtime, so to say. You, you choose it in the beginning by sending a so-called cipher spec. Um, but you will hear much more about this in a later lecture. So for now, let's enjoy the break and let's be back at 10.53, I suggest. So see you then and enjoy your break.
So, welcome back from the break. I hope the um, audio is working again. And uh, in the break, we got a new visitor as well, who may help understanding. Um, okay, who will try to support us with, with her purring. Um, so, uh, in the meantime, you see, I also fixed the chat. So now your chat messages will again show up on top. Um, the last question that I uh, missed to uh, explain before the lecture is um, can there be, can't there be something like overflows? Um, so yes, indeed, if you use this sort of operation uh, like um, addition modular 2 to 32, then you can have overflows, but um, so which means it's not really suited as an invertible building block, um, like in the SPN scheme. However, in the sort of so-called ARX schemes, add, rotate, XOR, where these um, additions are used, these integer additions, um, this is taken care of by uh, using them in a specific way that does not need to be invertible. Okay, um, so let's head on to the second half of the lecture where we want to talk about encryption. How, uh, so modes of operation, how to protect confidentiality. Um, so uh, let's have a look first at, um, at the first suggestion about how we could do it, but we will also see that this has some problems. So uh, let's see an example of how not to do it. And this is the so-called ECB mode of operation, which is short for electronic codebook, which we already saw in one of the earlier questions. Um, so what we saw before the break is that we have these um, block ciphers. You see here now that I often represent the block ciphers just as a mapping from M to C, and I write the key inside the block cipher instead of an, as an extra input. This is both to keep the pictures clearer and to just say this is a key dependent uh, permutation. So since we already have this block cipher, which translates plain text blocks to, um, to ciphertext blocks, it looks like a pretty forward thing to do how to build an encryption mode out of it. So what we simply could do is if we have a message M, which consists of many 128-bit chunks, M1, M2, and so on, up to ML, we could simply um, apply the block cipher first to the first block, take this as the first ciphertext block, then as the next one, and so on. So this is straightforward, but it's also pretty insecure. Um, so what my question, of course, uh, is here, what are the major problems of this uh, scheme. It looks like I lost my focus, here we are. Um, so uh, this two mode has actually two major problems and ah, cat, please don't act. <laughs> Sorry, the cat is playing around with the mouse. Uh, of course she is and is going to the wrong slides. So there we are now. Uh, so it's your time to uh, produce uh, some input again. Namely, do you see any problems of this mode of operation? Um, I'll briefly show it again afterwards. Um, so let's just go briefly back one slide. So the mode we're looking at is simply, oh cat, please, please stop doing that. The mode is simply, um, there's cat hair all over the laser sensor of the mouse, which is one of the problems. So the mode we're looking at is this one here. We have, um, we're just translating block by block. And the question is, what problems does that have? So the options here are that the AAS block size is too small, that identical blocks are translated to the same blocks, that it's not possible to decrypt, or that identical messages are mapped to the same messages. And um, I see you already have um, a good either intuition or a good understanding of what's going on. So let's get through the individual options. The first option here was that um, the block size is too small. Well, this is not the case. Um, I will mention later again that the block size does have an influence here, but 128-bit blocks are definitely big enough. What is definitely true is what almost all of you voted for, namely, if we have a message which continues, which contains some repeated blocks which are the same, then these will also show up as the same in the ciphertext. What this means is that I can detect a certain sort of pattern in the ciphertext. So, um, for example, if I have um, uh, if I have an an image with many in which many blocks are are the same, 
um, because for example there are all white portions of the image, um, then I will also see this pattern in the ciphertext because it will show up if the image is encoded in a very naive way, of course. Um, I will also have these repetitions there. Or also if I'm looking at a text, for example, if some parts of the text are the same for a length of at least 128 blocks with the right offset, which is just 16 bytes, so 16 characters or even less depending on the encoding, then I see this pattern. Um, so I can learn some information about the plain text just by looking at patterns in the ciphertext. Um, I actually have an image uh, example for this, which is pretty famous, um, uh, namely the Linux penguin when translated with this mode of operation. It appears that this picture got lost in the presentation version. You can see it in the handout version of the slides. Um, there was one vote for um, not being able to decrypt. Um, this is wrong. We can simply decrypt by taking the inverse of the block cipher and applying it to the ciphertext block. So this is easy. There are also some votes on this one here, which is also true, namely that if you have um, two messages which are completely identical, then their ciphertexts will also be completely identical. Now this sounds a bit weaker than here, because here you really see patterns within a plain text, whereas here you only can see if two uh, ciphertexts are completely identical. Um, however, this is still relatively important because it does actually happen pretty often that plain texts are identical. This is because we're often not so imaginative in what sort of information we send. So this may be, for example, because we're sending only very short replies to something like yes, no, maybe. Every yes and every no and every maybe will always look the same. Or um, if you think of um, serving websites or so, uh, you could instantly see when people are receiving the same content on their website or stuff like that. Um, so this is also a problem. It's a bit less bad than this one, but it is a problem. And the good thing is that um, we can solve these two problems pretty much in one go. So let's head back to the uh, slides here. And let's go on within the slides. Um, first, I saw that there is a question here. Ah, this is only a comment on the slides. Well, thanks a lot. Um, okay, then uh, let's get back to the actual slides. Um, was there something on YouTube? Uh, no, nothing except for comments on the cat. Um, so she hasn't really left us now. She's just lying there and listening. Okay. Um, so let's find a better solution and let's first uh, define what our solution should actually achieve. So what the resulting scheme should actually look like in terms of an interface. So it's time for these Marty formulas again. Let's have a look and dissect them a bit. So what's written here is that uh, on top, an encryption scheme is a keyed function. So like a, bla uh, like a block cipher, it does have a key. Uh, to distinguish encryption schemes from block cipher, I'm using these uh, calligraphic letters here. So calligraphic E means encryption, but of the encryption scheme, not of the block cipher. Um, so it takes as input a key, that's the first input, both the encryption and the decryption need the key. Then there is this thing marked in green here, which is new and which is to fix the second of the problems we had. Namely, um, the problem there was that identical messages are translated to the same identical message. This is fixed by this nonce here. So nonce is short for a number used only once. And this is exactly what it is. So um, this can be something like a random number that is supposed to randomize the, what the ciphertext looks, looks like. Um, it can also be something like a message counter, like the first message I sent to you has a one and the second you answer has a two and the third one I sent to you has a three and so on. Anything that is guaranteed to be different between multiple encryption calls. Um, okay, so this is the, the sort of surprising part here. The rest is not so surprising. So the extra input I have here, um, if you're confused about the notation, maybe rewatch the previous lecture. The, the last input we have here is, in the encryption case, the message, which is translated to a ciphertext of approximately the same size. And in the decryption case, it's the ciphertext, which is back, mapped back to the message. So the important differences between the encryption scheme and the block cipher are two here. 
First and most crucially, it takes inputs of arbitrary length. They can also be longer than one block. And the second important thing is that we have this randomizer in here, the nonce, which is to solve the problem of um, an adversary who could uh, detect if the same message is sent twice. Um, if we, um, we name the individual things, the nonce is called n, the message is called m, the ciphertext is called c, and we usually write it in this notation. So the first input, the key, could either be written inside the braces, so d of k, n, and c, but we usually just keep it in the subscript here. This is the notation that uh, people use most often. Okay, um, I see some questions are coming in. Um, isn't a message counter nonce too predictable for an adversary? That's an excellent question. Um, the good news is that many encryption schemes, but not all of them, can deal with this predictability. Uh, so if the first message is encrypted with one, the next with two, and so on, um, an adversary will of course know in advance what nonce the next uh, message will be encrypted with. However, if the nonce is mixed with the plain text um, in a sufficiently complicated way, then the attacker will not able to be able to exploit this knowledge. Um, we will see in a moment that the nonce is actually a public value that is sent along with the message if it's not clear from the context. So knowing the nonce does no harm in this context. Um, the predictability can be a problem in some cases, but for more modern modes, it's usually not a problem. And actually, a counter has an advantage over a random number, namely, if you have, for example, a 128-bit counter, it's guaranteed not to repeat for 2 to the 128 um, steps or messages that you send. Whereas if you use a random number, if you remember the birthday paradox from last week, if you have a random 128-bit um, nonce here, for example, it will already repeat by accident after approximately 2 to the 64 many messages. Um, of course, um, using a counter requires that I never restart my counter with the same key. So for example, if I have a long-term symmetric key and uh, one day I talk to you, we exchange some messages 1, 2, 3, 4, and the next day we talk again, I cannot restart at 1 again. I need to continue where we were to prevent repeating things. So this can, in practical context, sometimes be a bit difficult to manage, in which case um, it may be preferable to have a, um, um, a random nonce instead of a counter. Um, so one other thing to take into account here with this counter thing is that um, a key is often not that long-lived. So, for example, in TLS connections, whenever you build up a new connection, you actually um, make up a new AES key. So, um, that's um, an alternative to always keep track of, your, of where your last counter was. It can be you simply exchange the key. Because the nonce must never repeat, but this is only for a specific key. It's totally okay if you have two different keys and both of them start counting at once, at one. Uh, there's also a message here on uh, Menti. Let's have a look. Um, in case of a block cipher, is it true that m equals m prime does not imply c equals c prime? Uh, sorry for this being hard to read, but I don't have an empty slide here. Um, so uh, in block ciphers, it is true that identical inputs give exactly the same output in case you use the same key. So a block cipher is completely um, um, deterministic. It does not have this randomizer thing here, which is why it's a bit difficult to use block ciphers to actually build such an encryption scheme, because you somehow need to bring this non-determinism, which comes from the nonce, into the block cipher. Um, otherwise, you um, carry on this uh, block cipher determinism to, to your mode, which would be a problem. Um, and this is also what we saw in the previous ECB mode, which simply used the block cipher as is, carrying on this property, thus leading to the problem. Okay, um, back to the slides then. So this is um, the uh, interface that we are heading for with encryption schemes. 
Um, below here, I'm just repeating what I said about the nonce, that it cannot be repeated. So let's have a look at how you actually use it and which parts um, Bob and Alice actually sent to each other. So I have a similar picture as we had in the last week for the message authentication codes, um, where what you see here is Alice is trying to send something to Bob. For this, she has the message she wants to send and she comes up with this nonce, either a counter or randomly. She puts both of them in the encryption scheme. I'm again marking schemes in green and primitives in blue to keep them apart. She also has the secret key that she needs for this. So by inputting the nonce and the message, she translates the message to a ciphertext. So this means that the nonce, like the key, modifies what this translation looks like. But it's still an invertible translation that goes back from C to M as well, which is exactly what Bob does. So Bob receives the nonce either explicitly or because he knows this is the fourth method, so it must be four, um, and the key. Both of them modify this description uh, this uh, decryption process, which decrypts C back to M. So this decryption process, once you fix a specific nonce and K, is again an invertible function, or supposed to be an invertible function. And what's important here is that you need now to send not only the ciphertext, but you need to agree somehow on the nonce, either because the recipient knows it from the context, or because you send it along. So in any case, the nonce can usually be a public value without causing any security problems. Um, in practice, it sometimes is not kept valid, but uh, uh, it could be public without problem. So let's have a look at one construction mechanism, uh, how to build such a scheme. And it will actually look a tiny bit similar to what we saw last week. So this mode of operation is called the block cipher chaining, uh, the cipher block chaining mode, sorry. Um, or in short, CBC. So it doesn't have anything to do with blockchains, by the way. It's simply chaining of blocks. So how does it work? It again takes the message and chops it into blocks that are as large as the input of the block cipher we are using. However, instead of just translating every message block uh, by itself, we now add, we XOR a value that depends on the current context. So in the beginning, this context is simply the nonce. So we XOR the nonce to um, the message block and then translate that. The result here is also xor to the next message block and then again translated. So you carry forward what you've computed so far. So the last input here will actually depend on all previous ciphertext blocks, which means in case, for example, the last block here is identical to one of the previous ones, it will not be translated to the same ciphertext block because this modifier here, which tells us the entire history of what we've encrypted so far in this message, will be different. Now, of course, it can by accident happen that you still have the same value here. However, this is something that only happens after approximately 2 to the 64 blocks. So it's usually not a problem in practice. Um, and this uh, mode is actually one of the examples that I mentioned where it's not secure to have a predictable counter, uh, but where you actually need a random one. And uh, one other important thing here to notice is that in this description, we're again assuming that the message is a multiple, has a, a length that is a multiple of the block length, which is of course in general not true, because we said it should be able to encrypt messages of arbitrary length. So what we absolutely need here is something we already saw last week, namely a padding scheme. So we need to introduce a rule that pads the message to a multiple of the block length before we start processing it. And we always need to apply this padding scheme for this to work. This is why I also said in the beginning that the ciphertext has approximately the same length as the message. Actually, in this mode, it will be a bit longer because we always add a bit of padding at the end here. Um, before we translate the last block. Okay, um, so this is the CBC mode of operation, which is used as a building block um, together with, combined with a Mac in TLS. There is um, one other con construction method, which is maybe a bit less intuitive, 
but which is actually pretty efficient and also used in TLS. And this other mode of operation is called the counter mode. Um, so, counter or for, sh for short, CTR. Um, let's have a look at the chat. There was some question there. Um, so the idea is to use the encrypted output as a nonce. Yeah, well, not exactly as a nonce because the name of nonce is already taken on the previous slide, uh, but as a sort of randomizer or as a number that indicates the current context and to always XOR that to the message, yes. Okay, um, let's head on now to the new mode, which is the counter mode of encryption. And it's called a counter because inside you have a counter. So what you do is the following. Um, in this mode, you need a nonce that's actually a little bit shorter than the input um, size of the block cipher. Because what we are going to do is we are going to take this nonce and concatenate a block counter to the nonce that we put into the block cipher. So um, the nonce is a random value or counter that identifies the message M in a protocol. And the second counter here identifies the block within the message. And um, when we encrypt these consecutive counters, we generate what is sometimes called a key stream. So a stream that um, can be expanded to any length by simply adding up the counters and encrypting. And this key stream can then simply be XORed to the message. And every block of this key stream here will depend both on the current position and on the current message ID, so the nonce, and on the key. So um, it will not be the same between two different uh, message blocks at all, unless the inputs are also the same. So as long as I'm not reusing the, no the nonce at some point or doing some error in my counting, I will never have the same input to the block cipher here and thus also never the same output. Um, so a different block is then added to um, each block of the message. <clears throat> so this is also called a streaming mode because we have this key stream here, which does not actually depend on the message. It's only XOR to the message afterwards. And this is similar to what stream ciphers do. Uh, one important advantage of this compared to the previous one, um, well, there are several actually. One of them is that when you implement this thing, you can parallelize this process because you don't need to know the input or the, the result of the first encryption to already start processing the next block. So for example, you can already fill up your CPU pipeline with the um, AES calls for this and for this and for the, say, for, for example, for the first four message blocks, um, have them nicely pipelined while encrypting. And then once the pipelines are empty again, you take the next few blocks. This is something you can't really do in the previous um, mode because there every operation depended on all the previous stuff. So you had to do it sequentially. Another important advantage is that in this case, you actually don't need to pad the message because in case the last message block is a bit shorter than 128 bits, you simply don't, don't take the entire key stream, but just take as many bits from it as you need. So if the last message block is five bits, you just take the first five bits produced by the key stream here and you get the five bit ciphertext block and that's it. So no padding necessary. Um, it's also a bit more robust in the sense that, for example, the nonce doesn't have to be random, it can also be a counter. Um, so why not always use this mode? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, it's definitely more attractive than the other one in most cases, which is why most of the um, encryption modes um, actually also use this one and not the previous one. Um, however, the reason why I'm explaining the previous one and why some people also use it is first, it has this um, property of, um, of collecting up the history of what you've done so far. This means that you can, you have now some intermediate result that you can also use for other purposes. For example, for authenticating the entire thing. Um, it's also uh, a bit more intuitive because it uses the block cipher more like it's supposed to be used in the sense that you plug the message in plus something else and you get the cipher text out. Whereas this is a sort of unintuitive use of, of the 
of the block cipher because you use some made up constants as an input and get something as an output that you just XOR to the message. Um, yeah, but you're right, in most cases, the uh, counter mode is the preferable one. I saw that there are some uh, questions here as well. Um, the first question, sorry again for this being hard to read. The first question is, is it safe to send passwords by email? Oh, uh, I think that's something that I can uh, discuss at the very end. Um, can you explain again why the nonce can be sent publicly? Um, I can try to explain it again for the two modes we saw. Um, so in this case here, knowing the nonce does not give the, um, the attacker any advantage because um, the, the nonce is like usually the message. It's something that you, uh, that doesn't learn you to learn either the key or to predict the output. We heard in the beginning that um, this pseudo randomness being unable to predict the output from the input is one of the core properties of the block cipher. So even if the attacker knows all the inputs here, it does not allow the attacker to predict any of the outputs at this point and thus to um, predict if they see the ciphertext, what the message could be. So it just simply doesn't give them any useful information. It's important to note here that public means that the adversary can read the nonce. Uh, it does not mean that the attacker should be able to modify the nonce. Because if the attacker can, try, can modify the nonce, they can try to do things they could also achieve by modifying the message, for example. Um, so authenticity is not included here. Uh, we will come to that a bit later. Um, if you look at the previous uh, mode of operation, at this chaining mode, then um, here you also see that, um, so the nonce enters at this point here, but uh, so what the attacker sees in this mode of operation here is they see the ciphertext that is transmitted and they know the nonce. However, again, because the block cipher is pseudo-random, the Knowing the ciphertext does not allow them to know the value at this point here. If they would know that, then by exoing the nonce, they would learn the message. But they never learned this block here in the first place. So knowing the, the nonce does not help them at all. I hope this uh, clarifies the question a bit. So in all cases, it's down to the block cipher hiding any, um, any information off the block anyways. Okay, um, so how do we then use this in practice or what else should you know about encryption modes? Um, the most important thing to keep in mind is that these modes, CBC and CTR, so counter, provide only confidentiality. So they hide the content of the message, the plain text, but they do not provide authenticity. So for example, uh, this is also one of the reasons why uh, the, the previous counter mode is a bit um, unattractive in some cases. If you look at this example here and say, let's say Alice sends a ciphertext to Bob and now Eve is coming in and Eve wants Bob to receive a different message. For example, because the message is something like your bank account value and um, Eve wants to modify it so that it looks like a smaller number. What Eve can now do is simply flip one of the bits in the ciphertext. And now if uh, Bob goes about to decrypt, then due to this XOR here, exactly the same bit position will simply be um, flipped in the message. So in the streaming mode, the relationship between the plaintext and ciphertext is way more obvious than in the previous one. Things like flipping a bit in the ciphertext translate directly to flipping a bit in the plaintext. This is because the message never goes through the block cipher. And um, it should make clear why using this encryption mode does not provide any sort of authenticity, any guarantees that the message you received was the one that was sent. Uh, and there are actually very few applications that need this pure encryption. Um, one of the places where you do find it is on your hard disk in case you're using disk encryption. And the reason is that on your hard disk, um, there is usually not a lot of room. Uh, and in particular, there is no suitable place to put the tag um, in an efficient way. 
And also, since you're doing probably random access on your, um, on your hard disk uh, and not sequential uh, access, um, you would also have trouble verifying the authenticity anyways. So disk encryption, um, where one of the most used modes is called XTS, is one of the few places where you can reasonably safely actually use the um, plain encryption modes. What you usually want instead is something that is called authenticated encryption, which combines this encryption, this confidentiality, with some integrity guarantees. So protecting both the confidentiality and the authenticity. How does this work? Um, or what exactly do we want to achieve and why? So the core um, message here is that if your data is worth encrypting because it's secret, it almost always um, also would harm you to have it modified. So you usually don't want it, want it modified. So what we want to combine here is the features of two symmetric schemes of encryption schemes for confidentiality and of authentication codes for integrity and authenticity. So we want to combine both of, both of them um, into one building block. Um, I just see there's one more, mess uh, one more question here, namely, is CVC actually used in practice? Um, CTR, GCM seem much better to use. Um, yeah, not a lot. So uh, almost all um, almost uh, all more modern encryption schemes default to using something like GCM, which includes counter encryption. So CBC is not used a lot, at least not for encryption. But if you remember back, this uh, CBC mode looked exactly like the CBC Mac mode that we saw in the Mac lecture. So you do find this building block, but usually not for uh, encryption only. Okay, um, so back to the authenticated case. Let's now expand our previous interface to take this um, confidentiality into um, account as well. So let's back, get back to our Mathy slide and add some more inputs and outputs. Um, what do we have here? So first to note, um, I wrote here instead of plain E, I wrote AE for authenticated encryption and AD for authenticated decryption. Um, since these objects are a bit newer, there is people don't really agree on what to call these things. So you will find different um, notation here if you follow different authors. So what are the inputs we have? We have the key again, we have the nonce again, which is uh, the key and the nonce here. Then you will notice that we now have two values of arbitrary length called A and M in the encryption case and A and C in the decryption case. A is short for associated data. And this is like a second type of plain text that is not encrypted, but only integrity protected. Whereas the message is encrypted and integrity protected. And in addition, you also have um, more outputs than just the ciphertext, namely you also produce a tag, like you remember from message authentication codes. And the decryption is then also not always successful. So it may be successful in that case, it returns the message, but it may also be unsuccessful if there was something wrong with your authentication tag, in which case an error symbol is returned. And the security goal of this is to protect confidentiality and authenticity of the message and authenticity of the associated data. That's the goal. So how do we use it? Time for our Alice and Bob pictures again. You will see these pictures are growing more complicated by the moment because we now have even more values to take care of. What have we here again? We have key and nonce modifying the encryption process. The associated data is also modifying the encryption process. So the ciphertext will depend on what the associated data looked like, but you cannot recover the associated data from the ciphertext, which is what you send along here is all the things I've also marked in black here. Namely, you send the nonce, you send the associated data in plain text because you don't want to protect its confidentiality. You send the ciphertext, which um, can be translated back to the message. And you send the authentication tag to protect all of this. Uh, so lots of things to, to pass on. Bob puts all of this into his decryption scheme um, and either receive the message if everything went well, 
or receives an error in case the tag didn't fit with the other data. Again, the nonce must absolutely never be repeated and again, a counter is usually okay. Um, what's also, also important if you're implementing this, um, you should wait until you have completely verified everything before you start returning your message. So you need to buffer it for a long time until you've checked it entirely and only then you start releasing it. This can be a bit problematic in implementations, but it's crucial for security. Um, yeah, is there anything important I should add here? Maybe a few more words about the associated data, what this can be. So an example for this is some sort of metadata or um, some addressing information, for example. Uh, so it can be something like um, this message is intended for this and that purpose and it's sent from A to B and um, here is some additional routing information or any other things that are simply not secret that may even be necessary for um, processing the data, so for routing it to the right recipient or so, but where it's important that this message remains authentic. So for example, you don't want um, any different, I don't know, routing information in there or, yeah. Um, what you can also sometimes put in here is um, context from the protocol where you're executing it. So some sort of identifier of the messages you received so far, because then you can at the same time acknowledge exactly what you've received so far or something like that. Um, what the associated data also means is that if you have an authenticated an encryption scheme, and you simply leave the message empty, then what you get is more or less exactly a message authentication code again. Something that provides authenticity but doesn't encrypt anything. So authenticated encryption, or AEAD for short, um, sort of solves all the uh, symmetric crypto needs that we saw so far. It can serve as a MAC and it serves as an encryption scheme, but with a bonus of actually verifying things. Um, maybe again, time to look at the questions if there are any new ones. Um, oh no, we've already answered those. Okay. Um, so again, time to look at an example of what these things actually look like. And the mode that we are going to look at is called um, CCM which combines the counter mode of encryption we saw so far and we, which we said was the more popular mode and actually the only mode supported in TLS, for example, for encryption and combines it with CPC for authenticity. So this picture looks a bit complicated. Let's break it down. What's going on here? So the inputs that to the scheme are all in this row here. So the input is first a nonce. This is first processed a bit together with the plain text and ciphertext length. Just ignore this part. This is something, some value that depends on the nonce and which initializes my CBC mo um, mode. Then with the CBC mode here, I'm absorbing all the associated data blocks. So I'm always XORing the data, calling AES, XORing the data, calling AES and so on. And I'm doing the same thing with the message. So I feed the message into my CBC Mac. Until at the very end, I receive an output after the last message block, and this is the tag T. So the above thing, the thing marked in green on top, this is a Mac. And on the bottom here, we have the encryption mode. So the message, in addition to being put into the Mac, is also put into the encryption mode. Um, using again the counters here, encrypting the counters, getting the key stream, XRing the message, and getting the ciphertext blocks. So this simply encrypts the message, and what you notice here is it also encrypts the tag. So this is a so-called MAC then encrypt scheme, meaning you first MAC and then you encrypt the um, uh, encrypt and MAC. So you encrypt the message and the tag you received. Now, this looks actually pretty simple, right? Also, I mean, the picture is complicated, but the construction is simple. You take an existing encryption mode and you take an existing MAC mode and simply plug them together. Um, so it looks simple. However, there's actually quite a lot that can go wrong when you do this. So there are many small 
details that you need to be attention, uh, pay attention to, such as whether the nonce goes into the Mac or not, whether the tag goes into the encryption scheme or not, uh, whether you um, authenticate your message or your ciphertext. So there are many sorts of combinations that you can actually do with these building blocks and only some of them are secure. So unfortunately, it's possible to combine secure encryption schemes and secure Macs in a reasonable, simple way and still uh, get an insecure authenticated encryption scheme. I won't go into the details here because this is a bit more complicated, uh, but it's important to keep in mind if you want to combine encryption and Macs, please don't do it yourself. Please use a predefined mode of operation that does it for you. And one example for this is the CCM mode, where the first C is for the counter encryption and the second C is for CBC Mac. Um, and another um, trustworthy mode that's also available in TLS is called AES uh, GCM, where uh, GCM stands for Galois counter mode. So this again does some uh, finite field magic for the Mac and also uses counter for encryption. And um, this GCM is actually the default in TLS, but I'm not explaining it here because it's a bit messier and harder to understand than CCM. Now, both of these are by, by default with AES. However, you could in theory also plug any other block cipher with the same interface and with the same security level into these modes. So it's nice and modular. Um, however, in TLS you have only AES available and it's um, an excellent choice in this case anyways. There is one other authenticated encryption uh, scheme in TLS and that is ChaCha Poly. So this is um, again based on the ChaCha stream cipher and it adds some authentication which looks similar to what GCM does, but a bit different. Um, so this is to have an alternative that's not based on AES, but it's used by far less often than the top two ones. Okay. Um, that's actually it for uh, today in terms of new content, but of course we still have time for questions and also for a little bit more inputs from you. But let me first uh, conclude what, we're, um, what we've seen today, if I can catch the right slide. Ah, it really doesn't want to go there. Ah, technical stuff, people. Ah, sometimes it would be great if it just worked. Anyway, conclusion, what did we see today? We saw that uh, symmetric cryptography can protect both the confidentiality and the integrity, or just one of the two. But if you choose to protect just one of the two by using either only a Mac or only a pure encryption scheme, you should be pretty sure what you're doing. So in almost all cases, you want to do both. You want to protect both. Uh, these constructions all use primitives inside. So primitive is the source of the security level. Um, typically, this can be something like the AES block cipher, but there are also other primitives. And um, talking about confidentiality specifically, um, this can be protected with these two symmetric schemes we saw today, pure encryption or authenticated encryption, which is what you should use usually. And next week, uh, we're going to see how to do this in an asymmetric context. Um, so how to um, how everybody can encrypt something that only one person can read. Uh, this is more specifically also called key encapsulation because it's usually just used to encrypt a key that is then later used with one of these two schemes to exchange the actual messages. Okay, so um, let's head on to the final questions, which means both your questions to me and uh, a few more questions from me to you. Let's see what we have there. Um, so uh, first, maybe to force you to recap a bit yourself, uh, my first question would be, what is a new word or concept that you have learned today? So anything that you didn't know before or that you had only heard and didn't understand before. Let me just have some inputs here so that we have a collection of ideas about everything we've heard today. Okay, so many people are already happily entering the modes of operation. Um, everything is new, okay? That's <laughs> maybe also a good idea. I guess you haven't learned everything today, but at least everything was new. 
Um, so some people say that the Mac concept was new. We actually talked about that last week already, so you may want to listen to that again. Um, nonces are new. They are definitely a very important concept that are unfortunately sometimes skipped a bit. So sometimes when you read crypto introductions, you hear quite a bit about block ciphers and encryption um, schemes, but um, these uh, introductions often hide this nonce input and just say this is somehow randomized inside, which um, is actually pretty dangerous and has ended up in many accidents in practi practice. Um, someone says the shoulder cat is new. Actually, it's not new. You also already saw that in the first lecture. Um, associated data is an interesting concept that has a bit of an unhandy name. Um, and it's also responsible for the AD in AEAD. Um, someone is mentioning uh, poly with, I think, even the correct numbers, 1305. Um, that's indeed one of the lesser known schemes because it's also quite a bit newer than the AES and was only added to TLS recently. Now, uh, what else do we have here? How stream cipher works. Great. Um, cha cha 20, yes. Um, I think that's about it. What was this? There is something CMM. This is not something I actually talked about. I don't know what CMM is. So maybe uh, look at the uh, abbreviations again. So CCM is probably what was referred to here. Um, okay, I guess that's pretty much it. So I hope that um, that was something new for you, even if you already heard about crypto. And I hope that if you've never heard about this stuff before, you still um, understood some of it or most of it. That's actually um, my next question. How much would you say that you understood so far? So both for today's lecture, but also for the previous lecture. So was everything completely clear? Were there most things clear, but some confusion? Or was a lot of it too difficult? Let's have a look. Okay, so most of you seem to belong to the, I understood most of it, but there were a few difficulties um, uh, group. This is actually what I was hoping for. So my, my aim is that you can understand most of it, but it's not all completely trivial. So that you also have some things that you can think about in some more depth to actually gain some, some real understanding there. Some people are saying that, um, you understood some of it, but many of it seemed tricky. In that case, I would be happy to know which parts are the most um, difficult because it's always not, or not always obvious for me which parts are difficult. So if you have any specific things that you thought could be explained better or that are just well complex and you need time for yourself, I'd always be happy to hear about that, uh, about which specific topics you're referring to. Okay. Um, that's it with my questions to you. Now is again your chance to ask me some questions. Um, we already had one question earlier that I skipped at the point, which was whether it's safe to send passwords by email. Well, there are some people who would say yes, and there are some people who would say no, and this depends on several things. Among others, who your emails are hosted by. So the thing is that um, email connections, so when the email is actually sent first from the sender to the um, email server who distributes the mails and then over several hops to the email server who receives the mails and then back to the actual end user, these intermediate connections are usually encrypted. So in particular, if you do something like go to the Gmail website, um, your connection to the endpoint is definitely encrypted. So you needn't be afraid usually unless you're using a completely insecure uh, mail setup of your stuff being um, intercepted on the way. Um, however, it depends a lot on where your stuff is hosted and whether you're really enabling um, these secure uh, communications. So this depends on several factors. Um, so of course, if you don't trust the, the hosting server, you are in trouble, but you're also in trouble, for example, if you're not using a very strong um, password to authenticate to your mail account or if you often leave your laptop lying around unlocked and everybody who opens it can simply go to your email inbox. So uh, there are many different um, 
uh, points to consider here and most of them are not really about the cryptography but are more about how do you input your data and how do you uh, protect your devices while they are working with the data. Um, in reality, many, many email passwords are still sent by email. I also sometimes do that. It's maybe not the best habit, but um, depending on how protected your email account is, it may still be a reasonable choice. So if you always properly lock your laptop, if you um, have a strong password that authenticates you to the email server and so on, uh, usually not, not that many things go wrong in um, by this way. If something goes wrong, um, it's most often probably not on the way between the email servers, but more directly via the user interface. Um, okay, what other questions do we have here? Um, why is it unsecure or does not work to encrypt and authenticate a message without associated data? Um, so this is okay. It's uh, absolutely fine to keep your associated data empty. So the actually original authenticated encryption schemes did not have this associated data. This is more an extra functionality, not an extra security property. So it's often convenient to send something along which is not encrypted, for example, because somebody on the way needs to see it, um, or also because just authenticating and not encrypting it costs a bit less, so if it's not necessary, why do it? Um, but it's not actually necessary to use the associated data. So if you have something that would be useful to send along in this uh, input field, do it. If you don't have anything, just keep the associated data empty. Um, some encryption schemes use associated data as a bit of an alternative to nonsense. So they do something like, as long as the associated data is never the same, the scheme also remains secure. So you can sometimes replace the nonce by unique associated data, but please forget at once that I said that and just see it as an optional interface or input field that you can use in authenticated encryption. You don't have to. You don't lose security if you don't use it. Um, then, uh, can I re-enable the hearts, please? Oh, um, I actually didn't actively disable them, but it could be that I had an empty slide. So I, when I prepare this, I always have these empty slides between the many questions and there I always have to actively enable the hearts. I think I usually did, but if I forgot, then uh, my bad. I will so, uh, do so again uh, next time and check that it's enabled everywhere. Okay, um, are there any more questions? This is quite a bit less than we saw in the last few weeks. So if there's anything you still want to know, we still have approximately two minutes left for you. Um, I'll also have a look at the chat if something happened there. Um, no, I actually think I already answered that. Okay, so while you're still uh, thinking for one and a half minutes, whether you still come up with uh, something, let me give a brief preview of what we are doing the next few weeks and what you will see this afternoon. So uh, there should be a tutorial about the exercises in the afternoon. You will receive or have already received the link for that separately. Um, if you already started working on the exercises, you may have noticed uh, that uh, some of the tasks cover topics that we didn't cover in the lecture yet. Um, we will cover most of them in the lecture, but some of the ingredients will only be explained in the tutorials. So uh, I definitely recommend going there. And I also recommend that if you're trying to solve some of the um, crypto challenges for the exercises and have absolutely no idea what's going on, maybe just wait for one more lecture or so um, before you lose hope. Um, so what's the plan for the next two weeks? Uh, next week we want to revisit um, or want to visit asymmetric cryptography. Um, judging on what you said so far in the inputs, I think that you already know one of the main schemes that is used in asymmetric crypto, namely RSA. However, we will see um, first that using um, RSA straightforwardly is not the best idea, but you uh, need to pay attention to a few things. And we will also see that there are some quite attractive uh, alternatives. And uh, finally, we will have a look at how to plug these things together to make up an actual authentication protocol. And this is already uh, also leading over to the last lecture, 
where um, I want to talk about some selected topics on higher levels. So we will um, talk a bit about protocols on the one hand side, but also about things like um, the entropy of key material, uh, also the entropy of passwords and uh, some other related selected topics that um, expand a bit on, on or put into context what you've heard so far. There is a question here, will the KU session also be uploaded? Um, as far as I'm aware, um, this will also be on YouTube and will remain there for you to watch or be transferred uh, as a file upload to some other source where you can listen to it. So I think um, if you're a bit late or so, you will still be able to listen all, to all the rest. But this is a question that you may also want to ask again on uh, Discord to confirm with uh, Daniel. Um, okay. Wait for one more lecture, <laughs> then lose hope. Got it. Uh, that was not exactly what I said. So <laughs> I, I hope you won't have to lose uh, hope at that point. Um, okay, uh, it looks like no more questions are coming in. So then um, thanks for your uh, inputs today and enjoy your week. We will meet again next week's time.